What's happening, everybody? And greetings from the quarantine land. You starting to bond with your dog a little more frequently and starting to speak to them in an increasingly affectionate way? Have you started drinking prior to your 10 a.m. cap? Are you eating too many cookies? A lot of things can happen when shit gets weird like this. In any case, drummer Alex Ben of Trivium is my guest today. Alex and I caught up amidst some downtime from a canceled tour in support of their new record, What the Dead Men Say, due out April 24th. We also talked about tracking Frankenstein drums with producer Josh Wilbur at Dave Grohl's studio, triggers, death metal, popcorn feet, and all that goodness. Also of note is that the next episode on the Crash Bang Boom podcast, I talked to yet another drummer who worked out of Dave Grohl's studio recently and also played with Testament. Life is strange sometimes, or maybe presently, all the damn time. If you like what you hear, Crash Bang Boom podcast can be found on iTunes podcast, my SoundCloud and YouTube pages, Stitcher, Luminary, Google Play, Podbean, and more. If you like what you hear, feel free to check out any of the previous 170 plus episodes to give me a like, a subscription, a positive review, and or a glowing something or other, maybe a rating, I don't know. Go for it. You can find me on Instagram and Facebook as well for additional content and updates. If you're looking at releasing vinyl, go on over to NorlandDriggerPress.com to look at the myriad vinyl coloring, packaging, mastering, electroplating, lacquer cutting, and more options. And you can use that handy little real-time quote generator to keep tabs on all of your items. And they print both 12 and 7 inch records in 150 and 180 gram variants. So give them a look-see, and that's NorlandDriggerPress.com. Might have to look into being one of those redneck auctioneers at some point. I can whistle pretty well. I suppose I could wear a cowboy hat if I needed to. Not many other job opportunities out there at the moment. All right, here we go about doing it to it. Crash, bang, boom! Crowds go mad with joy. Yep, 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 yep. Yeah! Alex Bent of Trivium and a whole bunch of other bands that we'll get into. How are you doing, man? How are you holding up amidst this coronavirus shit? <laughs> I'm doing all right, man. You know, just uh, in the same boat as everyone else, man. Just trying to stay inside as much as possible and... Uh, you know, just following the rules, they're really cracking down over here. So, um, you know, you can't really leave counties anymore, uh, which is probably for the better. But just practicing and then coming straight home. Um, I live in Modesto, California, so about an hour from the San Francisco Bay Area where it's really, really bad. Um, right. But, yeah, you know, just just hanging in there, man. You know, how about yourself? Doing pretty good, man. I've uh, because my wife is working from home and there's no daycare. I have my son from about eight thirty in the morning till six thirty p.m. and thankfully he naps. So during that nap, I take a bike ride and to my practice space and play drums in the ghost town that is our practice space uh, and come back and start it all over again and just rinse and repeat. That's been my Monday through Friday routine. It's kind of crazy, man. Right on. Yeah, I mean, yeah, pretty much the same thing here. Um... It's really, really eerie going outside and uh, not seeing a lot of people out, you know. Uh, well, Trivium's new record, What the Dead Men Say, is due out April 24th. So tell me a little bit out about uh, how that's been impacted, be it uh, tours that you were amidst or subsequent tours, PR, etc. Tell me uh, how what's been going on with that. Well, we were actually supposed to be in Asia like last week. I was supposed to be getting back from Indonesia a few days ago, and that all unfortunately had to be canceled. As far as press goes, we've been trying to do as much as we can, you know, using technology. Thankfully, you could do a lot, you know, using the internet, um, but it's still it's still not the same, you know. Um, we have to, we can't get together, you know, to do press as a band, you know, traveling. The guys are in Orlando, Florida. I'm out here, so traveling isn't happening. Uh, the other day, we did a really cool thing where we did like a full band interview, and we were all on Zoom. So things like that make it a little easier, but we're just in the same boat as all the other bands. It's a big waiting game. Gotcha, man. That is uh, that is unfortunate, but as you said, everybody's in the same boat, and we're all having to deal with it to varying degrees, but it is certainly... Uh, as I've said previously, no precedent for it. So uh, just trying to acclimate to this sort of new world in which we find ourselves is baffling and, and a little frightening and just completely surreal, you know? Absolutely. Um, our bass player, Paolo, he made a good point the other day 
for us, you know, we're in a fortunate position where we have a new record that's about to come out. So there's at least something happening for a lot of bands. It's just a it, like a big pause, you know, so there's not, you know, there's nothing you can do. At least we're in a position where we have an album coming out and we can still have that momentum going. It, it's It's unfortunate for a lot of other bands that are just stuck right now, you know. Right. Well, tell me a little bit about the recording itself uh, and, and your experience uh, play, playing drums on it, obviously. Uh, where did you go uh, to record it and who did you work with? And just tell me a little bit about the experience of recording it. Definitely. We recorded the drums at 606 Studios, um, which is Dave Grohl's studio. And that was the best recording experience that I've ever had. It was just incredible from the moment we got there. You know, to not wanting to leave after we were done. I was like, this place is just so cool. Wow. It was it was great. Uh, we worked with Josh Wilbur again. He did the last record, The okay. Sin and the Sentence. And working with him is always just, it's great. We have such good, like, chemistry. And uh, when, when we all get together, it's kind of just like magic happens. So it was great working with him again. Um, they recorded the guitars and bass and vocals all at Full Sail in Orlando, okay. Florida. And then we actually did the drums last this time, which was interesting. Wow. I don't think I've ever done that before. No. So I went out to Florida and I played on this really nice electronic kit and pretty much just did demos with the guys. And that gave them, you know, the things to play with. And then by the time they did the drums last in LA, I mean, I was pretty much playing along to like a fully mixed record. So that was really cool. Wow. I've never done that before, but I, I would definitely do it again. If, if the uh, situation, if it was necessary, you know? Yeah. Tempo mapping is something that I like to talk to people about, especially in some of the, the more technical music where that happens a lot and things get uh, very gridded and whatnot. Tell me a little bit about when it came down to tracking. I mean, that's amazing that you <laughs> track into a fully mixed record. Uh, did you have your parts pretty much uh, worked out going into it uh, via the demos that you did and you tightened it up in the meantime and you were able to go in and and kind of knock it out fairly efficiently or was it pretty a laborious process? Um, no, it was exactly that. It was really awesome for me because I got to do the demos in Florida, get everything mapped out as far as like the clicks and all that goes. And then I got to go home for a couple of weeks. So while the guys were finishing all their parts, recording the real parts for the record, I still had that time to just really tinker with parts and make sure, is that Phil, is that really what I want to do? Or do I want to take that away? I can really listen to the guitar parts and bass parts. So by the time I was at 6.06, I, I was really comfortable. I, I pretty much had a vision of exactly what I wanted to do. And uh, it, it worked out great. So it just pretty much gave me more time to just feel really solid going into the studio for my part. Nice, man. Did you use uh, all of your own gear in the studio or did you use some of the studio gear? No, we Frankensteined my kit and Josh Wilbur's kit, which we I I had the same exact setup that I used on the Sin and the Sentence. So we were at 606. They had endless gear. They were super cool. They were like, use anything you want. So I had a lot of options. Uh, but at, in the end, Josh and I, we still went back to what I used on Sin because it just it worked so perfectly. It was the sound that we were all looking for. Mm -hmm. So it was Frankenstein's kit of a Pearl Masters series, I think, mm -hmm. and then a Crush kit, which is my kit. So gotcha. put it all together, and I had like four toms, 8, 10, 12, 14, I think, mm -hmm. and then 16 floor tom, and then 18 floor tom. So just a massive Frankenstein kit. It was really awesome. Nice. That's cool that you worked uh, with Josh Wilbur. I've spoken to a few drummers that have worked with him, namely uh, Goose that played in Norma Jean. They recorded both uh, Polar Similar and uh, Wrongdoers with him, and both of those records sound ridiculous. So uh, I'm, I'm actually a fan of, of his production. Um, but uh, it sounds like you two have a good chemistry and a good sense of what drums work. And y'all worked in a killer studio. So the whole experience sounds pretty amazing. 
It really was. Josh Wilbur is just a wizard, man. I mean, he's he's invested into the art of recording in the same way that myself and the guys have invested into our instruments. But yeah. it's awesome because Josh is a drummer too. Like that's his that's I believe the first thing that he did, you know, coming into music is he was a drummer for lots of bands. So ah. for me, I'm working with someone that understands my ideas and is also able to add on to my ideas in really cool ways. And, and he's done that with pretty much every drummer that he's worked with. You know, they, they all have these awesome ideas getting thrown at them constantly. So it's really, really awesome to work with him in, in every way, not just because of those things, but because he's just such an awesome guy to get along with. Um, Working with him on Sin, it was like, okay, like it's it's obvious that we're going to go with him again on the next round because it just makes it so much easier when you don't feel like you're like locked in a studio and it's like cabin fever and there's any <laughs> tension or anything. For mm-hmm. us, it was just like, you know, a walk in the park. It's like, all right, let's pick up, you know, pick up where we last left off. Let's do this, you know. Very cool, man. So with Trivium, uh, how did you get the call to join the band? And tell me a little bit about the audition as well as learning some of the backlog material uh, and, you know, kind of finding your voice uh, in the band moving forward with a band that's been around for, I guess, at the time you joined them, probably about 17 years or so, I believe. Yeah, I joined them. Yeah, joined them three and a half years ago. And uh, yeah, it's been quite the journey. But the way it started, it was really random. I had just gotten home from filling in on a tour with Angel Vivaldi and Gus G. So I was doing double duty and thankfully I was feeling real, you know, pretty sharp at the time. So I got home and then I got, I got a call from my buddy named Sean Glass, who's a really good friend of mine, um, of the band. He's always been someone that if he hears of anything, he always contacts me and says hey this is uh you know this is something that could be opening up so really great connection to have but he called me and was like hey man um trivium might need a drummer if you're interested you should learn these two songs because that's what they want to see a drummer play and the two songs were rain off of ascendancy and then world goes cold off of silence in the snow Mm. so it was like a fast song and a slow song so right right away i was like yeah that i'm definitely really interested so i pretty much hung up the phone and got right on spotify and learned those songs and then i recorded a video for them the next day so i was like trying to make the video and still learning the parts at the same time but yeah i sent in the video and they were really excited. So I like within three days, um, I got a call from their bass player, Paolo. And he was like, Hey man, he's like, we really dig your plane. It seems like, you know, you have a really good reputation and all that stuff, but we want to fly you out to Florida and just kind of hang out and talk and kind of see, you know, where things go. So about two weeks later, I flew out to Florida and jammed with them, and everything went great. And then right after that, we went to Europe. So the way that it all happened was, you know, my buddy Sean Glass, but then there was also some other close friends that they reached out to that had put in a good word for me. Rather than holding a big, like, open audition, they just wanted to go to people that they trusted to see, hey, who do you think is going to be the guy that would work out with us, not only musically, but as far as personality goes as well. So Mm -hmm. Mark Lewis, uh, amazing producer that I've worked with in the past, was one of those people that they reached out to as well. So thankfully, I was fortunate enough to have multiple people saying my name at the same time, saying, yeah, Alex is your guy. You You should try him out. So that's why I was fortunate enough to get that call and even during that call they you know they were like yeah you know if we jam and everything goes well we would you know we'd love for you to come out and do our european tour and that month long european tour just went great and at the end of that tour it was pretty much like sealed the deal they were like man you know we would just love to keep you around and if this is something that you want to do the gig is yours and i said yeah let's let's keep on going and that was three and a half years ago and now it's just been a wild journey. 
Yeah, I bet, man. Uh, tell me about some of the bigger, more incredible and or memorable shows that you've played with them uh, in the last three and a half years. Yeah, those would definitely be the the second time that we went back to Europe. We did Vakken and we did Woodstock in Poland. And that was just dream come true for me. I mean, I grew up watching all the bands play the Vakken Festival on YouTube and would always just watch and dream. And then I was there, you know, on those stages doing those things. And the, uh, the last European tour we did as well last summer, we played Download Festival was one that I always dreamed of playing. And these mm. are just massive crowds. Like I think the Poland one, from what I heard, was like 500,000 people or Jesus, something ridiculous really? like that. Yeah, like just ridiculous as far as like attendance. I don't know if that many people was watching us on the spot, but I know that the attendance was something just ridiculous. I mean, from the drum riser, I'm assuming it looked pretty fucking massive from your perspective then. Yeah, just a sea of people. Uh, so I just it's just felt like I've been in a dream, you know, even the even the club shows that are just wild, that are just memorable. You just never forget them because of the energy and just how how fun it is how how good it feels so everything has just been going really great i mean i i just i feel very grateful and fortunate to be in this position to be able to do this you know nice man uh well i was checking out some of the other projects that you've been involved in and uh between brain drill who i checked out uh which is of course like pretty breakneck drum slaying style uh as well as <laughs> as well yeah. as like some of you know like i guess the dragon lord and then of course trivia and battle cross etc some of the stuff you've been involved in uh, i'd say you've had a streak of playing some pretty technical heavy music throughout the years so tell me a little bit about some of the key drummers that inspired you uh as you were coming up uh, do, do you feel like playing in Trivium you had was it easy to just tone some of that down because I know you there's some of that stuff that is like so wildly busy and super super technical and there are moments of some of that in Trivium but I'd say it's probably more balanced you know absolutely when I was younger I was shot out of a cannon so I was just like I want to play as many notes as possible be the fastest I, I feel like every like you know young up-and-comer is like that especially when you get involved in the technical death metal world which is what i came from my first wow. tours were all like underground super brutal like west coast technical death metal so it was like everybody <laughs> was pushing the limits so i think that really inspired me a lot but as I started to get older and play with bigger bands, like a big game changer for me was when I started filling in for Testament and working with Eric Peterson. He really taught me how to like trim things, trim, you know, take it back a little bit and and be more solid and, and creative in different ways. So mm -hmm. having that, you know, having the background of like the tech, technical death metal, but then also being fortunate to have someone like that around that knows how to make a song with drums, you know, not just blast beat, blast beat, double bass, double bass. Mm -hmm. I love all that stuff. Don't get me wrong. But yeah, working with, with Eric, it just, I feel like it took my playing to a different level. So now these days with Trivium, as much as I love the speed, the double bass, the blast beats all that fun stuff at the end of the day i just i want to make a song i want to i want to make something that's going to complement the music and not take away in any way you know mm -hmm. if that makes sense of course so i just i'm just i'm up there just you know chopping wood man i want to be as solid as possible i want to try to make the band sound good and feel good so i think my focus over the years has changed to be more like that rather than like you know the brain drill and archaic and all that stuff that I did before. Don't, mm -hmm. don't get me wrong. I, I mean, I love all that music and that'll always be my roots. But nowadays I'm just like thinking in a completely different mindset. Yeah. And revisiting some of the material that preceded your entry into the band, uh, did that also kind of give you a bit of a roadmap as to how you could approach some of these songs? Yeah, it absolutely did. Um, Going back to when when uh, our bass player Paolo called me, 
he was like, yeah, we're definitely really interested. We have a European tour coming up. Are you down to learn a set list? And I was like, yeah, let's do it. So they sent me an entire set list that I, I was able to learn it in about two weeks. I pretty much took it like a song a day and I was able to really start to understand their sound and what the drummers had done in the past You know, so it it gave me exactly what you're saying, kind of like a vision of like, okay, this is where they were, this is where they're at, and what could I do to be where they're going, if that makes sense. Got you, got you, man. You and I have some interesting parallels in that uh, your early playing, uh, from what I was reading, it sounds like you were involved in marching band, concert band, and jazz band, as was I. Uh, so tell me a little bit about the experience of that, as well as maybe some teachers that you had along the way in your formative years, uh, that maybe sculpted you. And then we can get into the guitar center drum off, uh, situation as well. (laughs) Cool. Right on. Um, yeah, I did marching band and jazz band. I was, I was way more into jazz band as opposed to marching, like marching, was way too like strict for me. I don't think I had like the attention span at that age to like march correctly and like, Oh, we have to play exactly at this velocity and then all play is one. It's not that I hated it, but I was more like, I just want to get on a drum set and play. So I did marching band for about a year and a half. And then I, I was like, okay, I don't know if I want to do this anymore, but the things that I learned in that short amount of time are things that I still use to this day, like all the rudiments, the paradiddles and mm-hmm. the five stroke rolls, yada, yada, yada. That's all stuff that is still like, you know, my roots. But at the end of the day, I was like jazz band, jazz band, like, cause I got to play a drum set, you totally. know? So I would show up zero period, you know, and do that. And that really inspired me to get into jazz, which is something that I still love to this day i love jazz drumming and i grew up watching a lot of jazz drummers watching videos of buddy rich and papa joe jones and i never really had instructors that sat with me and showed me how to play drums Hmm. the only time i did anything like that was i had an instructor show me what things look like on paper that was something that i wanted to learn when i was like 15 or 16 so i was already out playing with bands and everything but i was like I want to know like what's a quarter note, what's an eighth note, what's a 16th note. So Mm -hmm. that was really cool having someone break that down for me. And then aside from that, it was pretty much just all watching on YouTube and then trying to get hands-on experience as much as I can. So like playing in different churches, going to open jams and getting together with other drummers and, you know, playing, shedding and things like that. That was really what, what taught me growing up. Gotcha. So did you come from a little bit of that sort of iron sharpens iron, so to speak, world of, of uh, church drumming and ultimately, I guess what people know as sort of gospel chops. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, you know, I, by the time I was like 15, I started playing in churches and doing all that. I definitely wouldn't go around and say, I am a gospel drummer, not, (laughs) not by any means, but I was, I was fortunate enough to be able to, to play in those churches and learn a lot. It it taught me everything about dynamics and flowing with a, you know, with a choir, with a bass player, with an organ player. So I think it definitely had a big impact on my playing. It was, it was like I was able to go and try out the things that I was practicing by myself. You know, you could play licks all day by yourself and play along to tracks, but It's one thing to do that. And then it's one thing to actually go and try it, you know? So it was, but it it was a cool thing though. You know, I was able to, I was able to really grow in that world and having, you know, being surrounded by some great, great musicians really, really helped me out a lot. Nice, man. Well, when it came to you uh, participating in the Guitar Center drum offs, tell me a little bit about prepping for that. Um, because I was, I actually just watched it a little bit earlier. And one, you looked young as hell, which is hilarious. Yeah. Because <laughs> I guess it was a decade ago. Yeah, um, it's wild. <laughs> uh, but I saw you were doing some left foot clave stuff. So uh, where, where did, I guess, the Latin influence slash uh, left foot clave stuff come from? Man, just being on YouTube for hours, man, just nerding out, like trying to look at everything I possibly could, you know, listening to a lot of different kinds of music. I mean, I truly love 
all of those styles. I love salsa music. I love gospel music. I love jazz, jazz fusion. I love country music. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I'm just all over the map. So incorporating all those styles into one, you know, that was a that was a big part of, you know, a drum off competition is you want to showcase different things, you know, you don't want to just get up there and blast beat for three minutes, <laughs> you yeah. know? So, but, but, but being a, being a part of that world was, was, I, again, I, it was a, a growth time for me. Uh, and being able to just be in that community of all those drummers that all have something to say in different ways. And you can kind of just look at every single player and, and be inspired in different ways uh, I first started doing those competitions when I was like 11 or 12. So I had just started playing drums, but I was like, screw it. I'll, I'll get up there and do whatever. And, you know, I would win the little store parts, like the, the district area or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> but, um, I, that's where I was able to, I, I met Eric Moore, which is to this day, one of my favorite drummers and a good friend of mine that was another person in my life that was like inspiration and someone that I was able to hang out with and just, you know, go to his house and play drums with him and stuff. So nice. all of it kind of connected all the, the, the drum off thing and all that It all, it all kind of fell into place and opened doors that, you know, to people that I still have relationships with to this day. Yeah, I've spoken to both Eric Moore and J.P. Bave. Uh, J.P. was it was crazy talking to him and about his process of winning uh, both the Guitar Center drum off and I think in the same year the Roland Electronic drum off as well. So he won like both of them, like yeah. the Nationals, uh, in one year. And he was the process in which he he was telling me about. You know, he kind of just shut himself down for a year and just lived in the space and went crazy. And then when he came yeah. out, he was able to do it. So props to him. But yeah, I was actually my wife and I were actually there when he won. It was some, it was this place in LA, yeah. but yeah, the video that's on YouTube where he won, I was sitting in the balcony and I was just like, Oh my gosh, this guy, this guy's definitely taking it tonight. <laughs> that is <laughs> awesome. Know? Wow, man. Well, uh, with some of these faster BPMs, uh, you know, and the use of smaller muscle groups to sort of squeeze out as many notes as, as, as possible, tell me a little bit about your journey into the more extreme music when you were young and maybe some of the technical or ergonomic epiphanies that you had along the way and or adjustments, you know, to be able to execute kind of this intense music or, you know, has it evolved over the years? Definitely. Um, when I first started getting into metal, I was like, man, like Slipknot and Mudvayne, like that's the craziest, that's the craziest that it'll ever get. And then I heard Slayer and I was like, whoa, like this is faster and it's even older. So there has to be a whole world that I haven't even tapped into yet. And yeah. then that's when I got exposed to death metal. And then from there it was like, oh man, like there's a whole other world, like listening to bands like Nile and Origin uh, vital remains going down that road of just the brutal, brutal heavy death metal, because I just wanted to hear what was the fastest, what's the most technical drumming out there. Right. Just being, being a really big death metal fan and a black metal fan and sitting on YouTube, all those hours looking at, you know, who's who and who plays for what band and all that. Um, so by the time I started playing in my bands like archaic, I had I had been playing along to that kind of music for a long time. Wow. I think the difference between then and now is I feel like my craft is a little bit more go like I said I used to just go for the speed. I was like speed speed speed. I wasn't really super focused on how clean it was and that's something that I've that I've tapped into more is like mm -hmm. I'd rather be a little bit slower but more powerful and proficient than like just speed for speed you know mm -hmm. so but yeah when i was younger i was just like putting on the fastest stuff i could try to find and then just trying to play along to it until my arms burned and my legs felt like they were gonna fall off you know <laughs> and i was really a way i was able to kind of develop technique i guess because it's like you got to figure out ways to try to execute without killing yourself and i think that's a big part of 
what technique is. You, you're just trying to figure out a way to get that execution, you know? Right, right. Uh, well, tell me about uh, triggers, because it's one of the things I've talked to John Longstreth about it. I talked to uh, Dave uh, Haley of uh, Psychroptic and some of these bands that play some pretty fast stuff as well and uh, their use of triggers and or what they think about them, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so is that are triggers something that you've uh, used in your projects throughout the years or? Yeah, definitely. I mean, when I started playing, like when I first started touring, you know, we're we're not a band that has an hour long sound check where I could stick a mic in the perfect spot and sound check my kick drum for 10 or 15 minutes straight or whatever. So yeah, yeah it was pretty much more for, for sound, you know, it, it was more like, okay, we're playing these small clubs pretty much have to throw my drum set on the stage and go. If I'm going to be playing all of this fast stuff, I at least want it to be, heard so that was a big thing when i first started playing with triggers you know and it's funny because you know obviously the whole thing on the internet for years people would get on and go oh triggers are cheating and it's it's funny how ironic it is that it's actually the opposite i always encourage people that are like man you know should i get triggers i'm like well make sure you play as clean as possible because triggers will expose you if you got the popcorn feet going on. So, right. you know, um, <laughs> that's one thing that I feel like it kind of helped me though, because I, it made me more focused on, okay, I want to play as clean as possible because now people are actually going to hear me. You could stick a mic in a kick drum and play fast and people, they're going to miss a lot. But mm-hmm. if you put a trigger on a kick drum, they're going to hear if you're, on or off so right uh that was always a a a fun part of playing with triggers is like all right i i gotta be on tonight i don't you know i don't i don't want to have popcorn feet going right do you uh do you warm up your feet a good bit before you play some of those shows in particular yeah pretty much i would focus a lot on trying to just make sure i was playing really clean and it's awesome because like with trivium it's I could do both now. Now it's a band at that level where there is time to get the mic in there and get that awesome natural sound of the kick drum Mm -hmm. mixed with the trigger. So that's what I run now. I have the trigger to kind of get that attack Mm -hmm. and then I have the natural kick drum to get that nice bottom and that that hitch in the chest sound. So um with them I do that and it's you know it's it works out great for me. Over the past year or so, I've taken the trigger out of my ears. I prefer to have I prefer to have a little bit of the trigger in my ear, but mainly kick drum, so it kind of makes me hit a little harder. It feels more like I'm not up there playing soup like electronics if that makes right. sense. Right. Of course, of course. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think the the general trigger sound kind of can be a sort of thin, papery, kind of clicky sound. So I think uh, blending it uh, and just having that to give you some articulation, but using as uh, the natural bass drum sound as well, the mixture of that and finding the balance, that's something that I, I hope uh, more and more people uh, do, assuming that they have the time like you mentioned, yeah. you know, and the, yeah. and the, whatever it is, the access, the money, whatever it is, you know, uh, cause I do, I do enjoy that more so than just sort of the straight clicky, you know, kind of nothing but trigger sound, of course. Oh, totally. Totally. Yeah. Sometimes I look back at the videos, you know, of me playing in those small clubs and I'm just like, man, it just sounds like there's just a typewriter up there, you know, <laughs> but Wow. But, you know, it was like it was like at the time, you know, a lot of like the death metal guys, like I said, they're like, well, shoot, I mean, I might as well at least have them hear my kick drums, you know. <laughs> so, yeah. But thankfully now it's like, cool, you know, I, I, I'm in a position where I can get the sound that I that I want, you know, so it's 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 awesome. And with the triggers, I use the uh, the TM2, Roland TM2. Mm and i'm using the rt 10k triggers which that's those triggers have been my go-to for like the past almost 10 years now uh the the tm2 i started using it when i started playing with trivium and it was actually suggested by josh wilbur and that thing is just great that's the closest thing to plug and go that i've ever used as far as a trigger brain so if anybody is listening and thinking about using triggers, that's definitely the brain to go with, in my opinion. 
Gotcha. Good to know. Good to know, man. Yeah. Well, uh, here we are in 2020, early into it uh, at that. So uh, where do you uh, foresee the next few months uh, going? Is, are there plans, tentative plans to pick back up on some of these tours? Or what? Uh, is there any you know sort of estimation of when you'll get back out there? Yeah, well, we have the tour with Megadeth and Lamb of God, which is uh, June and July. We haven't heard anything about canceling any of those dates yet. Okay. Right now, we're just waiting to see how things pan out. Um, right now, I think the last they said was like April 30th, right? Or something? I think so, yeah. Yeah, so that's the word right now. Who knows what's going to happen at that time? I don't think anyone does. Right. We're just going to have to play it by ear. I mean, people have uh, bought the tickets. They've bought the meet and greets. And it would be really unfortunate if none of that was able to happen. But as of now, from what I've heard from management and everything, nothing is canceled. So that's at least a good sign. you know. Right on. Well, I certainly hope for it. Yeah. Uh, and I don't, I don't know if y'all are coming to New York. I thought maybe y'all were. So... I, uh, I've been a fan of Megadeth. I'm old enough, uh, probably old enough to be your dad, but I, I saw, oh, <laughs> I, cool. saw I saw, uh, I saw Megadeth on the Rust in Peace tour. Uh, I believe that they came out in nineties. Oh. So I think I saw him in like 91. So, uh, and Whoa. they were, they were, <laughs> uh, awesome. they were absolutely slaying. That band was so killer at that time. My goodness. Uh, That's great, man. Yeah. yeah. We're stoked to be touring with them, man. I mean, it's supposed to be like one of the big tours of the summer so it's like we're really crossing our fingers that it's able to go through you know um but it, it's totally out of our hands it's out of all the other bands hands so we're just all in the same boat man we got to just wait and just try to stay updated with the news and you know i mean that's another thing too is trying to get the information that you need to know what's going on but also not getting sucked into it to where you start to get paranoid oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> that is the slippery slope in which we live. I basically just, yeah. I, I read the news a little bit when I get up in the morning and I don't look at it. I don't listen to the president. I don't listen to any of it because I, it's out of my hands. I know what I need to do to keep myself alive and hopefully not affect my family. That's what I'm sticking to. Send me some messenger pigeons or some fucking smoke signals at some point when this shit's over. I just can't do play by play, man. It gives me way too much anxiety. Yeah, there's just so much information and conflicting information. Yep. And it's like everybody has something to say and a different view of how they look at it, you know? And it's yep. like, hey, I'm in the same boat as you, man. I'm just like, you know what? I'm going to try and stay updated as much as possible. I mean, you know, I, I'm i I'm lucky to be surrounded with, with great people that that stay up to date with everything. I mean, everything from my band guys to my wife to even management, you know. So we have a really good team of people that are always thinking ahead and, you know, figuring stuff out. So that kind of calms me down, gives me a little bit of ease. But, you know, we'll, we'll just kind of see what happens. I mean, it's all about just keeping a positive attitude. And, you know, at the end of the day, I feel like everything's going to be okay. You yeah. know, we just got to, we'll, we'll get through it. <laughs> yeah, I hear you, man. Well, Alex, it was good talking to you, man. Good, uh, best of luck going forward in 2020. And hopefully uh, the Megadeth thing happens as well as any other plans. And it's not maximally affected, but uh, definitely best of luck. 2020 uh, is uh, ascending back up to uh, some degree at some point in the near future. Thanks, man. I really appreciate it. I appreciate you having me on here. And it was awesome to meet you and talk to you and shoot if if you want to come out to that new york show man let me know and uh we'll definitely have to get together and hang out sounds good man i'll be talking to you soon cool all right man all right everybody thanks for tuning in and thanks to alex for rapping and tim tatuli from adam split pr for reaching out we'll catch you on the next one crash bang boom <laughs>